You gonna do it? Are you afraid your girlfriend's gonna come around and catch you? Hey, my girlfriend. No, nah, he just come around peeking her window. Watch it. Yeah. All of the uh, this acting in thirty something years plus and still going strong. Uh, it's all uh, really due to uh, one famous producer named George Powell. Um, uh, I kept my promise, George. Uh, George produced War of the Worlds, of course, and others, uh, famous movies, and he was uh, uh, Warner Brothers. I had a, a small shop uh, across the street from a, a gift shop called Gallimaufry, which is the same place where Lindsay Lohan walked out of the store with her necklace, you know. The kid needs some help, right? We were very tight with the, all the local artists, so if you were a painter or a sculptor, you could put your stuff in on consignment. We didn't sell a lot, we were, you know. We were uh, just in and out of college, and uh, but we were supporting uh, expression of uh, artistic expression. And Venice Beach is uh, real famous for that. And of course we had the film industry, but I had no intentions of, of doing that. I had a degree in art history, and I wanted to homestead in Alaska, having had a, a minor in um, animal husbandry. But uh, I couldn't do the veterinarian thing because my phalanges, the ends of your fingers, uh, mine aren't properly developed. So long story short, couldn't do that. Well, I was saving my money to homestead in Alaska because I, I revere uh, the natural uh, way of, uh, of the planet and, and uh, try to encourage people to be part of it instead of you know, trashing it. And I wanted to homestead and do nature photography and and, and live there. Well, I, ne I never made it. Um, I got sidetracked. I had a friend who, uh, his house burnt down. I went up and helped him rebuild it. Came back to L.A., opened the plant, a uh, little gift shop uh, called Govinda's Gardens. You know, it was very arty, hippie. It was wonderful. Great era, by the way. And hippies did take baths, just in case some, you're, you don't know. Uh, it was a wonderful culture. I had a gentleman walk in, it was George Powell in my shop, and he said, Hey, um, I met you the other day at my, at my uh, son and daughter-in-law's uh, shop. And I go, Yeah, I remember, the antique store. And he says, Well, I didn't have a chance to talk to you, so I, I just want to introduce myself. And he hands me a card, and it says Warner Brothers Studios, and it says uh, George Powell. And I said, Oh my God, do you know who you are? I said, <laughs> uh, you, you made War of the Worlds. And he said, yes, he's very kind. And he says, he said, but what's more important is that you have a unique look. And you're sharp enough to, you know, maybe uh, if you, would, if you would, wouldn't mind, play uh, a coroner in a movie called Doc Savage. And I go, well, I'm not really an actor. He says, look, I'll, I'll pay you $400. I'll get you in the Screen Actors Guild, get you your card. I'll guarantee you two days so you can be taft Hartley. Labor laws are important in Wisconsin. Hello. Um, and I go, well, that's cool. I'll have a little money left over to move to Alaska. So I, I did, and I've kept my promise that I always tell people he discovered me whenever there was an interview. George Powell is responsible for all this. So I thought that was my whole career. And when I was getting ready to go to Alaska, I got a phone call from Michael Douglas's people to do Cuckoo's Nest. And the only reason that happened was because George's people, uh, their casting director, was casting for... Michael Douglas and Saul Zantz and Milos Forman. So after 127 days of learning my craft, camera, lenses, etc., um, blocking all those wonderful things, uh, I said, well, this is kind of neat. And I had done a lot of hard labor before that, different kinds of jobs, wood cutting, you know, carpentry, etc. And I go, hmm, well, this is kind of nice. And you meet interesting people, and it's an ancient art of telling stories. Well, that's kind of neat. And I thought, well, well, now that's a quick career. Now this is over. Now I can go to Alaska. Well, I got another phone call. And I went to a, an office, and I met Peter Locke and Wes Craven. And they were young and hungry, and um, they told me about this little story about a you know, family living in the desert. And, you know, to me, I was just thinking, oh, okay, I can do that. And, uh, another paycheck, okay. Um, and we... I don't know, I, I found Wes uh, intriguing, uh, very calm, uh, very educated, um, real nice guy, and his stories were kind of wicked, and I liked the, 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 the parallel between the characters in The Hills Have Eyes, 
as it relates to you know, modern life. They wanted to see something different, but something different saw them first. The hills have eyes. Mister, don't take your family back in that area. The silver has been gone for 40 years now. There's nothing back in there but animals. We finished the movie. It was a smash hit. Um, uh, it was pretty controversial at the time. And um, Wes handled the uh, uh, negative... Uh, uh, adverti uh, not advertising, but the, the negative uh, audience response uh, quite well. He's, like I said, he's a pretty, a pretty sharp guy. And I, I got to see how the process works on how you can uh, take a concept, have a story, and even if it's not someone's cup of tea, if they're sharp enough to listen to you, you can still understand its social relevance. <laughs> We were in New York at a screening of uh, uh, Hills Have Eyes, and um, I remember sitting behind a, a mother and, and son who, were right about the point when they said, kill the baby, mother gets up, tries to drag the kid out, and she says, this movie is sick and depraved. Now I'm dressed as Pluto, and I tap her on the shoulder, and I go, I thought I was being clever. I go, you're damn right, lady, this movie is depraved. Uh. And, and it really bothered her, so she ran out, and I told the kid, I said, look, I'll look, after, I'll look after your mom. This is the best part of the movie. Enjoy it. And, and I, I just I wound up just walking out behind her back and forth as she paced frantically in the lobby, uh, just totally, totally upset. And finally got her to calm down. I said, uh, please explain why it really bothers you. I mean, uh, nobody really got hurt, didn't hurt any animals. Uh, it was all implied. Uh, it's not gory. Uh, uh, but it is terrifying because uh, uh, most of the action and stuff is implied and with backstory as to how things are happening, what could possibly happen. Even the stuff you don't see, it's in your mind. Is it? So I think it's, it reads stronger. I'm not a gore fan. I, I appreciate special effects. However, um, uh, Wes is smart enough to know that uh, you don't need the gratuitous to uh, uh, creep somebody out, for instance. Kill a babe! Kill me! I got to be on the on on the uh, poster, and and the reason was I was told by Peter Locke that um, when I played Pluto, I, I wear the I hides across my shoulder, the cowhide. And well, under my arms, I was having major surgeries for a number of years, um, off and on, and and I had open wounds with bandages, and I would have to you know hide them the best I could. That's why we dressed the uh, the wardrobe in that manner, and. Um, and you know we were rough and tumble, running, jumping, leaping, and you know, and it's hot and hot as hell in the daytime and cold at night. It was very difficult uh, conditions, and um, you know I didn't complain. I did my job, tried to do the best I could, did a pretty good job. And they said, "Hey man, you're just such a trooper, and you're really helping us out. Um, I'm going to give you a million dollars worth of free advertising, putting you on the poster." And I go, oh, "Thanks," and it really it kicked my career up a bit. You know, I helped a lot. <laughs> The most shocking, terrifying film you will ever see by Wes Craven, writer and director of The Last House on the Left. Well, what I saw was uh, um, a friend who was getting uh, some more success in his career and uh, branching out and getting some acceptance because, uh, you know, Last House was kind of controversial, to say the least, and Hills Have Eyes was too. It got an X rating in, in England. And if you look at it today's standards, it's just silly because there's hardly any dressed blood. There's hardly any spurting blood. Um, there's, you know, there's uh, almost zero nudity. Um, there is, uh, it's very, very uh, tame and mild to today's standards. Father Isaiah said this place is the incubus. If he knew. No, who's cheap? The attraction for Deadly Blessing was the gals and, you know, the introduction of Sharon Stone, perhaps. Uh, he had uh, Ernest Bordine in it. And, and then the, the reveal at the end that the mother was raising her boy as a girl, um, which kind of uh, ties my character into it because I, I knew, you know, William Gluntz knew what was going on. And, and in the beginning you think, oh, here's this, you know, challenging fellow, but there's more going on. Stop it, Glutz! Incubus! You retard! 
mean, I had fun going to the, the parachute shop and getting the rigging for the, the drop out of the barn and all that. That was kind of neat. Um, I like the technical aspects of filmmaking as much as I do the artistic. We went to Texas. It was kind of interesting because I had a um, pen pal girlfriend who I went out to Texas to meet before uh, we started filming for a couple of weeks. And my God, she was a gorgeous uh, Texas gal, you know, savvy, you know, self-confident and uh, a lot of ch charming attributes. Then we went uh, to the set and uh, it became very apparent to me that um, uh, she didn't care too much for uh, um, Hollywood and uh, the attitude, the egos, and especially the starlets, you know. We had Sharon Stone and uh, a couple other gals and, oh my God, I mean, uh, they couldn't sit in the same room without, you know, looking daggers at one another, you know. And it really f felt like that. Well, my, uh, my girlfriend was actually a, a tall Texas blonde and uh, gorgeous. And um, I remember when uh, I introduced her to Sharon and uh, the other two actresses, uh, they were obviously so jealous, which is silly because they were all gorgeous. Um, and they kind of just sort of dismissed her, which <laughs> wasn't very good. I remember her claws going into my leg uh, when uh, uh, some gal, I won't say who, actress came up and said, could you open this uh, can of pop for me? And, and looking at me and not even looking at my girlfriend and uh, saying, oh, is this your girlfriend? She's so nice. And could you open this for me? And I could feel the claws in my leg and I'm going, wow, this is very challenging. Uh, hmm, how do, I, how do I handle this? So I said, oh, yes, and you fill in the blank for the name, and I go, uh, you grab it like this, and you pretend you're like, uh, you know, wringing a chicken's neck, and you got to snap it, and then that's how the cap comes off here, and, then, and she walked away, and, and there was some guy in trousers walking by, big hefty fellow, probably a gaffer, and started, you know, charming him with a smile and teeth, etc., and, uh, um, it was one of my first lessons in, uh, I guess, uh, mm, insecurity and uh, ego and all of that kind of stuff. Yes, it does happen. There's, uh, there's almost a cat fight. As a matter of fact, I had to call Wes Craven from San Antonio. We were filming out of Dallas because uh, my girlfriend had said, um, I don't like these Hollywood people, and um, if we're going to you know, continue being together, uh, um, you need to get another career. Well, that was a tough one. I said, well, what are you giving up? You know, it's, it's kind of rough. It's kind of, kind of a lot to land some guy, you know. And so I remember calling Wes up uh, on a Sunday night. I had a, I had a I don't know, 8 o'clock call Monday morning. <laughs> he wakes up. I go, hey, I'm having a, uh, Nancy and I are having an argument. And you, you, you have to control your actresses. They're being little bitches. And, uh, um, you know, I, I appreciate someone being professional, doing their job, knowing their marks, knowing their lines, and, and, and performing, but all this extra garbage that goes along with it is really problematic because it's messing, messing up uh, my relationship with my girlfriend, and uh, I'm trying to convince her that, you know, we're all really nice people, and she's getting the wrong messages here, and she's convinced otherwise, and, and he, so he's exasperated. He's like 11 at night. He goes, well, where are you? Oh, well, I borrowed... You know, Tom's uh, uh, town car. I'm in. Uh, I'm in San Antonio. I'm only a couple hours away. Michael, you got, you got to be on the set tomorrow. We had that big scene. I go, yeah, I know, but uh, I just want your word that you'll. You know, he says I can't control them. I go, wow, a challenge. So uh, we went back and uh, we just stayed away from him, and we got through the shoot. And um. <laughs> get down. We filmed at, a, at someone's farm, and uh, the lady who uh, was uh, the owner of the farm um, wanted us to unpaint the house and the barn and take remove from the dirt shrubbery and landscaping that they had put in. And we were all like, well, why? And uh, the only response I heard was, well, it'll, our, our taxes will be a little higher. Sure, okay. 
And, and then, of course, she was hitting on all of the staff. It was, I mean, the crew. And it's just strange. I like to just, you know, do my job, go back to my hotel room, prepare for the next day. I, I try not to get involved in all that drama. I get paid for scripted drama, you know. That's how I work it. But, but West handles it very smoothly. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just not, you know, hit your mark, action cut, that's great. Uh, this, if you're thinking of being a director, you got a lot more to deal with than than just what you think your job is. It's it's a good story. Uh, he there were problems with production. Um, maybe there were some compromises in 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 the story. Uh, I think some of the dialogue and. Some of the uh, reveal of the plot was uh, a, a little bit uh, um, stretched out and not revealed at certain times. It could I think the plot line could have been uh, had a better rhythm to it as far as uh, how it was presented to the viewing audience. And uh, the subject matter, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't think it was just that over the top enough for people to go, "Yeah, you got to go see this movie," you know, because the payoffs of the of the mo the monster at the end. The devil, for instance, yeah, well, okay, and uh, everything else was the same old story, you know. Um, you know, if you don't stay in the Hittite cult and you go outside, you're going to get killed. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it, I think it needed some more elements to make it a little more uh, pizzazzy, you know, a little more exciting. Um, uh, so it, it wasn't, uh, you know, a super success in that re in that regard. Way out in the desert. Further than the eye can see. Beyond all towns. All roads. Where few have ever been. Who'd put a welcome sign out here? The hills still have eyes. Then there was uh, part two. Uh, it was shot in different uh, film style. It was a little crisper. Um, I, I liked the look. Uh, there was a few things I would have changed. I like the dog flashback. There were some fun things. Uh, the Reaper character, uh, John Bloom's character, uh, the makeup was terrible, and he didn't really care too much about the part. It was obvious. Just, uh, and uh, I think uh, he should have been recast, to be quite honest. Um, but still, it, it did okay. I would say uh, he was maturing as a filmmaker. Um, I really liked Serpent and Rainbow. Uh, uh, that had a nice edge to it. I liked it. He, uh, he always has a little bit of tongue-in-cheek humor. And, and, and like, uh, we'll just look at uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of clobbers you on, on many le uh, levels simultaneously, which I appreciate. It kind of just kind of warps your whole psyche, uh, which is, uh, I think, the strength of, of his work. Um, Invitation to Hell eh, didn't do too much. Uh, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, Deadly Blessings was uh, was a, a different twist. Uh, I mean, I think I, I think the guy could do like you know a love story or something along those lines, a romantic comedy. I think he would be uh, right for. But once you get your uh, feet in the door and people start uh, pigeonholing you, um, it's it's challenging. Even if you're Wes Craven, simply because uh, the investors kind of go with well, what have you done in the past. Uh, let's look at the numbers. It, it is show business, so don't ever forget that. Um, the independent film circuit is maybe more arty, but you know it's good to be able to have both. You know, pay your bills, mortgage, and all that stuff. The sand runs with fire and blood. And the hills still have eyes. <laughs> Well, uh, people that know me, I, uh, you know, I'm always uh, try to be as polite as possible, but I, I tell it just like it really is. Um, we did Hills 1 and 2. It was a wonderful success. And then uh, years and years later, you know, now they're doing a remake. And I heard about uh, this rumor, and um, um, I never was contacted by anybody. Uh, it came out. I got invited to a premiere. I liked the beginning quite a bit. The style was kind of neat. 
but after about 15 minutes uh, into the story, um, they left the, me and the audience sitting where, well, what about this cool little village that was, you know, a nuclear test zone where people lived? I wanted to know, how did they survive? How, how, give me a little more backstory. It was intriguing. I liked the mannequin thing, the, 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 whole, the soldiers come in. And it, 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 was, it was setting up almost like a Rod Serling uh, story. And then it just turned into uh, kill, chase, some kind of device to, to trap or this or that or kill the soldiers and other people and um, uh, monsters. And I, I didn't really care about anybody in, this, in the story which is a major flaw when you start losing your emotional connection to what's to the people and where things are happening to and, and how they're going to get out of the situation or how to get there or, and why is this all happening and and just all the gimmicks and gadgets and 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 and, and uh, uh, you know death it just turned into eventually I said you know what this isn't a movie at all this is a video game it's not a movie no more Please, go, go. Now, of course, people who had never seen the original, you have every, every so many years, you have the youth coming up to the ranks through the years in different time blocks of time, and, and this is their, you know, Hills Have Eyes. Okay, I get that. But I thought it was um, very weak. Like I said, I only liked about the first 15 minutes. The rest of it, I just got up and walked out. And I was at the red carpet. I just, I just, oh, this is just terrible, you know. And, um, you know, and then people go, oh, what do you think? Well, if you're going to ask me, I'm going to tell you the truth. And uh, I know it did, it did, did some box office, and then, um, you know, and I'm glad people need to pay their bills. Well, they did a part two. And I received a phone call uh, from Peter Locke's office uh, in L.A. asking me if, um, if I was available to be in part two remake. And they thought it would be kind of neat homage to have a role in that. They were filming in Morocco. And I go, sure. Oh, you know, look, I have no bones to pick, except now. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to work with my friends. You know. Well, I, uh, I said, uh, how, how is this going to happen? He says, well, we have a meeting in L.A., and you can meet the director. And I go, okay, great. Uh, how are we doing that? Because I live 400 miles away from L.A. And he goes, well, uh, can you meet, can you be here tomorrow? I said, well, yeah, I better get my plane ticket right now. Are you covering that? No. Well, okay. Technically, I'm an L.A. actor because that's my union base, so they don't have to, you know, accommodate. But, you know, I said, hey, uh, you know, I think it'd be great. I'm the producer, and I think it'd be great if you were in the movie. So I made my arrangements, rented the car, got an airplane ticket, got a hotel, uh, called him up, went to the meeting, some little office that you can rent by the day in downtown L.A., and well, it, was, it was pretty pathetic. And uh, what I mean was the maid hadn't been in for months, dust bunnies and spiders, and just, just a place to meet actors and have a phone, that's about it. And I go, hey, how you doing, old buddy? How you doing, Pete? You know, Wes was somewhere else. I go, so where's the director? I want to meet this guy. I want to see the script, and let's talk over the part. And he goes, oh, uh, he had a meeting. <laughs> really? Uh, I thought we were having a meeting. Well, it's just so good. It's good. We'll see you in Morocco. Handshake, deal. Uh, I think about, I don't know, two and a half months goes by. And somebody says, hey, yeah, they're filming in Morocco now. I go, well, shit, they better send me my script. Call the office, get the secretary. He didn't want anybody from the original. So I was, like, perplexed. Yeah. You know, oh, it wasn't on you, the handshake man, you know, word of man, shake and all that, and handshake, a deal, trust me, you know, my word is gold. Yeah, it comes from Mary, Mary uh, gee, uh, uh, Jerry Maguire, sounds like. Uh, <laughs> my point is, uh, get, get it in writing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I have no intention of ever seeing the, the second remake. I hear it sucks. And, um, yeah, if you're going to do a remake, you know, do it for the right reasons. If you just, if you just want to, you know, do a carnage franchise like Saw and be a billionaire, well, you know, hey, no one's stopping you, and kudos if you can do it. I personally don't like uh, uh, carnage films. I think they're pretty uh, purient and uh, uh, debasing, and uh, uh, there's no real artistic value in it at all, uh, except for a special effects team. But 
you know, how many times can you, you do carnage and, and blood makeup and effects and part, body parts exploding? Uh, oh, let's do it, and, you know, stop frame and slow motion. And, uh, okay, well, after you've convinced me that th people can die and things can blow up and bodies can bleed and heads fly apart and all that, and, you know, the audiences aren't 12 years old anymore, are they? Or are they?